Um, I grew up in Texas, um, went to TCU, spent two and a half years there, loved it, uh, ran cross country and track, it was a lot of fun. And then my parents said, hey, if you want to stay at TCU, uh, you got to start paying for some of it. So I transferred out to Texas Tech, going to the cheaper school, enjoyed, uh, enjoyed West Texas as well. Um, and then from there, went to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Seminary, RTS Jackson, and then worked at First Presbyterian Church for eight years. And now in Birmingham, Alabama, work at Cahaba Park Church. And uh, it's been fun being in Alabama, so it's fun seeing Ole Miss and State and then seeing SEC football notch it up a few um, a few ways with Alabama and Auburn. It was a whole new level. Do we have any Alabama Auburn fans in here? Roll Tide. We got a Roll Tide. We got, we got Ole Miss. We got War Eagle in there. Ole Miss, State, Bulldogs. There we go. Um, well, hey, um, you'll see my wife's the camp nurse, so if uh, you uh, ha- ha- happen to see her this week, I hope you don't. Uh, hopefully it's a very healthy week for you. She's here, got two boys, seven-year-old, four-year-old. Uh, one of them dark hair, straight hair, the other one curly-headed, kind of almost got a, a fro going. Uh, so he's a little bit more a little bit more noticeable. Um, is this anyone's first time, RYM? Wow, it's about half the room. It will be hey, one of the best weeks over the years. Our students, it has been one of the things they've enjoyed the most. Great teaching, great fellowship. And one of the things I love is that even in this room, we get to see the invisible church become more visible as we're with other members uh, of Christ's body. So I'm um, glad y'all are here. One of the things I'm going to do each day, I want to give away books. Um, I know in our day and age, we're used to the phone, the iPad, just with our finger turning over. But books, if you're still familiar with them, they have paper made from trees, those types of things. There is a book table. And one of the things I want to do, not only just introducing good books to you, but good authors. Um, knowing that, hey, if Tim Keller wrote this, you know that this is going to be good. You know if C.S. Lewis wrote this, this is going to be good. They've got a lot of works. And the first guy, maybe some of y'all may or may not have heard of him, C.J. Mahaney. Um, one of the things that I love, Sovereign Grace Ministries um, is one of the ones that he started. Uh, he's been a pastor for many years in Louisville, Kentucky now. Um, but humility, a lot of his books are very short. Um, you're looking 100 pages, so it's not as intimidating. But as we're talking about evangelism, and is Christianity contagious, one of the funny things that goes against culture is it begins with humility. Um, and, and he does a great job of unpacking this because everything in our culture is saying make much of yourself, and that's not the gospel. The gospel is not to make much of Jesus. So, to give away the books, going to do a little trivia. It'll be random stuff. Uh, Netflix is one of those things that I have enjoyed over the past few years. And there is an old show that I watched as a little kid. And I would imagine some of you have probably seen the reruns of it. It's coming back in some form to Netflix called Full House. Anyone familiar with Full House? Yeah? Is there anyone that can name, last name included, all three of the daughters? Hands in the air. We think? We think? What's the, do you remember the last name? Tanner. Tanner. Can you remember the, you remember the daughter's names? DJ, Stephanie, and Michelle. Look at that. We got it. Oh. Nailed it. And then, um, have any of y'all heard of J.I. Packer? Um, great theologian, one of the great minds that God has blessed us with. And one of those things just in terms of, I want to know more about this God who loves me more, his character, his attributes. Um, this is one of those, you hear those terms, classics, um, knowing God. Um, there will probably be plenty of copies of this at the book table. would highly encourage you to go through this. I had my RUF campus minister at TCU. He and I met once a week going through this book. And I would imagine your youth leaders, this would be a book they'd probably be willing to go through with you. It's one that you're probably not going to read uh, in a matter of days. You will probably read a chapter or two at a time, digest it, maybe reread that chapter or two. But very rich, very good. And so combining my colleges, TCU and Texas Tech, are there any guys that could possibly either name the coaches for those teams or starting quarterbacks? Anybody? Hey, look at this. Now, 
Girls, you may want to actually look up Texas Tech's coach. He's known um, a lot of the girls enjoy watching the sidelines just for Cliff Kingsbury. Um, so Cliff Kingsbury uh, is the coach for Texas Tech. Gary Patterson for TCU. Anybody know the mascot for TCU? Horn Frog. Horn Frog. There it is. The mighty Horn Frog. Does anybody know what the defense mechanism is of the Horn Frog, by chance? The, the, the sign for TCU, very intimidating right here, isn't it? They shoot blood out of their eyes. So that, that, that's, that's where that comes from. So each day, we'll give away some books. would encourage you, go to the book table. A lot of great resources there. Get your nose in these books quickly and often, and you will be blessed for it. Well, this week, we're going to be looking at evangelism, contagious Christianity. When you hear that word evangelism, what comes to mind? Speaking the gospel. Anything else that comes to mind? You've heard the good news, teaching. Sometimes you may hear equipping. Um, a lot of times, when these, and there's a book that will give away, I think tomorrow, Concise Theology, another one by Jack Packer. But a lot of times in the Christian circles, there's words we hear, justification, sanctification, glorification. We hear them, and we'll say, yeah, I know what those mean, but we really don't. And so know that it's okay if we don't know what these words mean. Um, and one of the things we want to do is unpack evangelism these next few days and just a simple definition is teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade and sometimes when we hear that we think okay the only way evangelism can happen then is if we stand up in front and talk yes that is a way that it happens and one of the things in a sense I'm going to be overselling this week is the manner of your lives is going to persuade those around you far more than you standing up in, a front, in front of a group and talking about gospel truths. Those will happen typically on an individual basis more than this right here stepping up in front of folks. But you are in one of the most fertile mission fields in all of the world. Your high school campuses, soon your college campuses. And a lot of times with evangelism, we think it's out there. It's the mission work. It's going somewhere else. But the thing we got to ask ourselves is, where has God placed us? And first is, where do I live? Who in my neighborhood do I know? How can I share the gospel with them? How can I sense, aim to persuade? And again, not with tricky words, but the manner of our lives. And then, where do I go to school? Are there folks around me that don't know Jesus? Are there those around me that need to know the hope that is found in Jesus Christ? How has God gifted me? Am I gifted musically? Is he put me around other musicians that may not know Jesus? Does he allow me to play sports? And are there folks on my team that don't know Jesus? So often we think if we do evangelism, it has to be out there. But the biggest thing is, what is right around us? Where has God placed us? And start thinking in those circles. So we're going to be in the book of 1 John uh, this morning. 1 John chapter 4. And the thing is, is if... Christianity is going to be contagious in our lives. If we want to see the grace of God bring healing and comfort to the hearts of those around us, then we have to examine our own hearts to see if we've been overwhelmed by the relentless love of God. If we want others to be overwhelmed by the relentless love of God, then we have to know what that love is, and that relentless love must change us first before we can be used to change others. We have to know the message, and we have to believe the message, we have to embrace the message. And when I say that word relentless, what we mean, and this is what I love about the gospel, nothing, nothing is going to stop God from loving his people. Nothing will knock him off his course and purpose in loving his own. That is the God who loves us. So before we read this passage, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to be in your word, to enjoy it, to know it, Father, that it would change us. And Father, pray that you would open our eyes, even while we are here this week, before we head back home, to the areas that you can use us to change lives for your glory. But Lord, if our hearts aren't changed, then do that work this week, that we would know the gospel. Lord, that we would know that we need you and that it is your love that changes us. Holy Spirit, do your work. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Hear the Word of God. This is 1 John 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is is so, also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Well, the first thing is overwhelmed by a relentless God is God's love revealed in Jesus Christ. We see that in verses 9 and 10 where it says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. God is love. Um, That statement right there sits well with most people. You can go to the atheist, to the guy who's just like, I don't really care about Christianity, and you say, God is love. They're not going to put up much fight to that. But the thing is, this passage is reminding us that God is love, but it's not in the way that most of the world would perceive or even like. What most people think when they hear God is love is they're thinking, well, God just exists to make me happy. Or God just wants me to to do what I think is best for me. Or God just wants us to be nice to one another. Or God just wants us to be accepting of everyone and let everyone, hey, you just chart your course, I'll chart mine. And there's no need to identify sin because God is love. The underlying theme with these mindsets is that it's centered on the individual rather than the God who saves. There are sprinkles of truth in some of those statements. But the problem with most of them is it's about the individual instead of the God who saves. And John in this passage is giving us a clear definition about God's love. And it's far better than anyone could imagine. And it's certainly better than God just wants to make us happy. First, if we begin with God's nature, verse 7 and 8, where it says, Be loved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Love is from God, and God is love. Love is from God like heat is from fire, or light is from the sun. We don't stand next to a fire so that we can get cold. We stand next to the fire because we know there is heat coming from that fire. Love is woven into who God is. Sun gives light because it is light. Fire gives heat because it is heat. This love becomes a part of the Christian. It's woven into his nature, not because it's there already, but it's because God is placing it there. The love we share is an extension from the one who gave it. Again, verse 10. Do you notice the position right there of God and man? This is important, where it says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. It begins with God. It doesn't begin with man. We've got to ask ourselves, how do we approach Scripture? How do we approach worship? How do we approach sermons? Are we thinking, what does this teach me about me first? Or are we thinking, what does this teach me about God? And we must always begin with, what does this teach me about God? Because when we say, what does this teach me about God? 
then change will begin to happen. Love does not originate in us. We cannot walk away from here this morning and say, I am going to be more loving because I'm a good person. We may start out really well, but we're going to fall short. We can't do it. We are not capable. Love does not originate in us. But it is God's nature, love, that must be woven into our lives for change to happen and that ability to truly love. And we have another aspect of God's pursuing and overwhelming love in verse 10. As I was talking about before, some of those church words that we hear. Propitiation. Have you all heard that word before? Yes, anybody want to take a stab at what propitiation means? Jesus satisfying the wrath of God. Perfect. The wrath of God, and one of the best analogies I've heard is that the wrath of God is coming at us like a tsunami. I mean, y'all familiar with what a tsunami is? Some of you guys in here may be pretty jacked. Maybe y'all been lifting all summer. Maybe you've been pumping a little HGH. I don't know. But even if you pump a ton of HGH, how well are you going to stop a tsunami? You going to be able to stick your hand out there and stop it? No. It's flattening you. Dead. Gone. And that is what the wrath of God is coming for us like. Until Jesus Christ intercedes. And that's why that word propitiation is so beautiful. So it's... He's came to bear our punishment for sin. He's removing the curse. It's that great manifestation of God's unilateral action to satisfy us in wrath. And an analogy that sometimes can help is there's not as much recently as especially back in 2008, the term foreclosure was at the forefront, not of many students' minds, but maybe your parents' minds. Are you all familiar with that term? Foreclosure. Someone owns a house, they've fallen behind on their payments. And the bank is coming to them and saying, unless you can come up with X amount of dollars, and by that point you're usually talking ten, fifteen, maybe even twenty thousand dollars, we're gonna foreclose on your house. You're not going to be able to live here anymore. And so if you imagine that's the position that you're in with your parents, that foreclosure's coming. This means that, hey, we're going to have to move. This may mean a new school with a different school district. This may mean a smaller house. This may mean sharing a bedroom with all my siblings, something that none of us want to do. And it's the bank that is demanding the payment be made. And so let's say it's two days before that, boxes, everything's packed, you're getting ready to go, you're crying, you're in tears, this is awful. And then the bank calls and says, the note's been paid. And you're kind of... What? The same bank that's demanding payment is saying the note's been paid. You don't owe anything. In fact, the house has been paid off. It's yours. With with God, He's the one demanding payment, but He's the one that's also taking care of the payment. And so that's, again, why propitiation. it It goes against everything we can think of. So as we fathom the radical nature of God's love, it will dramatically alter us. His love will be woven into our lives. And that leads to our second point. Overwhelmed by a relentless God leads to loving others relentlessly. And you see that throughout all of these verses, that love one another just keeps coming up again and again and again. And as a student, at least hopefully you figured it out by high school, repetition, if you know the teacher says something six or seven times, Does that mean that it's probably got a greater likelihood you'll see it on a test again? Yeah, she's saying, this is important. Know this. And that's why John here is repeating this again and again. Love one another. Does that come easy? That a lot of times can be one of the most difficult things to do. We know it. We can say it. But that right there, it's, it's the heartbeat of evangelism. We need the love of God to be woven into us so that our heart is beating to love others. Because that is where change begins to happen. And that's what we're going to unpack a little bit more. So for us, when we hear this, sometimes we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But other times we're like, it's like the kid being asked to do chores again and again. Do I really have to make my bed? Do I really have to cut the yard? Do I really have to do this? And when it comes to other people, the list of excuses, I mean, it's like, come on, you know my neighbor, he's a little nutty, so you can understand why I would not want to love them. 
or this person, they are the most annoying person I have ever been around. The moment they start talking, it is like someone taking fingernails to that chalkboard back there and just going down. That is what it is like as I hear them talk. They are the most annoying individual I've been around. Or I just look at that person and I want to vomit. I just want to be done with them right now. Or, you know, the junior high girls, that they throw out the OMG, I can't believe she just wore the same thing I wore to this dance. I'll never be her friend again. Just throwing that out there. Or, you know she goes to the other school. We can't talk to her, can't associate with her. Or, this person has made my life miserable from the moment I stepped in this school. Every day I come to school, I do what I can to avoid them because I know it is going to be painful, it is going to be awkward, and that they spread things about me that aren't true. Do I really have to love them? And so I would imagine for all of you, we can come up with a long list of reasons not to love some of the people in our lives. And it may be a mom and dad, it may be siblings, it may be friends, it may be a coach, it may be a boss. But the thing that we've got to remember, we may come up with a list and it may start here and go down to here. But the thing is, that list of excuses that God has to not love us, man, we can throw that out to the ocean. That is a long list. And so we've got to have that perspective of, Lord, there is no reason for you to love me. So, Lord, even though this person is difficult to love, because your love is woven into me, give me the grace, give me the ability to love others. So, if his nature has been woven into ours, then it will compel us to love those around us. And if we're not compelled, then we have to ask, has God changed my heart? If we struggle with loving others, or if we despise it, there is a love which says, has God changed my heart? Because it is very easy to show up to church every Sunday, show up to church every Wednesday, show up to a Bible study, and for the gospel to have never change our hearts. And if we're going to effectively share this message with others, we have to boldly declare it. I mean, it's just like I was asking earlier, college allegiance, which college you love. And the thing is, is you have to love that college to go through some of the crazy stuff. I mean, like, when you go to college, we had to get in line six hours before the game started just to wait to get in to sit down, and then the game would start four hours later. I mean, that's ten hours of waiting to watch a football game that you could watch on TV with a better view. Why do you do it? Because you love it. And you want to cheer your team on. You want to be a part of it. Or the other thing is, how many of y'all hunt? Some hunters? Y'all get up at ridiculous hours in the morning to go hunting, don't you? Ridiculous. And a lot of times, it's not very comfortable out there. A lot of times it may be 25 degrees, 35 degrees. Why do you get up and do it? Because you love it. And that's the thing, we all have those things. We do it because we love it. Not because, hey, I love standing outside in the middle of nowhere with no cell service where I am freezing But you're doing it because you love to hunt. And like the football games, I think, what is it that we love to do? And do we love others? Has the gospel changed our heart? Um, I know these two things, when you put them together, Christian and rap, you're thinking lame in a hurry, um, understandably. But there are some great Christian rappers out there now that are really changing that label, and I'm grateful for that. Any of y'all familiar with Trip Lee? Trip Lee, man. There's others as well. You got Tadashi, Lecrae, but Trip Lee has a song, Love on Display, where he says, Lord, I'm so amazed at the way you show your love to us, that you ain't stop us in, that you would come to us. We sin so much, that feeling came numb to us. Our hearts lied to us. Lord, please school us. While we pursued fake treasure like a dumb jeweler, you plan to redeem man. You would come scoop us. Who is a man that you would notice us? God, mold us. It is pure grace that you would even rest your eyes on us. Much less leave the heavens. Come and die for us. Humble to the point of death, you would cry for us. Bloody sweat, no rest, you would for us. Took blows, you gave flesh. You were my donor, eternally merciful. Never bipolar, you pitied me. 
took the weight right off my shoulders, stood in my place, erased the death in us. You showed your love and died while we were yet sinners. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And ever since the nails went bang, all you people respond and sing hallelujah. You put your love on it. You put your love on display. I'm so grateful that God gives men and women minds to write words like that. I could never think like that. I could never write those words. But he catches it so well. Christ put his love on display. And that's what we get to do as we love others. We get to put the love of Christ on display. And that's, again, going back to the idea of contagious When you think of the word contagious, what does that mean? You can get sick from them. It spreads from one person to another. And obviously in those settings, we're thinking flu, cold, or back in the day. Probably all of y'all have been vaccinated and you didn't have to go through the fun of chicken pox. Anybody have to go through the fun of chicken pox? Oh, we got a couple. Man, that was miserable. You did get to miss like two weeks of school though, so that was kind of nice. But usually we think of it in a very negative light. And yes, we should think of it in a negative light in that sense. But when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to evangelism, that's it right there. Are our lives contagious? Is the gospel, in a sense, so alive in us that as we interact with others, that they see something that they want? I've heard someone label it in a sense of contagious enthusiasm. Not just this blind happiness, but knowing that no matter what circumstances happen in life, they see that you have a joy, and they want to know more about that. So are our lives contagious? Are we putting the love of Christ on display? Um, Because as Christians, loving others, it's not an option. (laughs) It's not like, hey, I'm a Christian now, but hey, I'm not going to love others. It's not optional. It's Again, like I said, I ran cross-country and track, and and during finals weeks, our coach said practice is optional, optional mandatory. Um, And so that means, yeah, technically it's optional in the NCAIs, but you're coming. And and this thing is, it's not optional. It is mandatory. You've got to do it. And so this is not a new commandment. This is not the first time it's here. It's been there in the Old Testament. We saw Jesus himself say words similar to this, Matthew 22, 37, and 38. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. That's where it starts. Love the Lord your God with everything that you are. But he doesn't stop there. He says, And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. Isn't it interesting how easy it is to tear other people down? I mean, that comes natural to me. It's easy for me to take that negative spin on someone else. Do do any of y'all watch political shows at all? I have stopped a long time ago just because it's so depressing. Um, But typically everything is a negative spin. Any of y'all watch sports shows? Yeah, I got a few. Usually it's a negative spin tearing this athlete apart, tearing this coach apart. And then if you watch, whether it's Entertainment Tonight, TMZ, are they uplifting all these folks, talking about how great they are? They're tearing them apart. We live in a culture that loves to tear people apart. So one of the ways in which we stand out as believers is we look to encourage others. And so... That desire to tear down and turn the light away from our own sin. He goes back to 1 John 1. We're talking about light and darkness. The reason we want to tear others down is because we want to deflect the sin, the mess that's going on in here. But if God's changed this heart, we want others to know. You too. You too can know about this. So you you can stop tearing others down. So that you can start building up. And one of the things that this highlights is the unattractiveness of Christianity upon first glance. But then that second glance, how absolutely gorgeous it is. Because as the light deals with our sinful hearts, we begin to understand why Christianity is unattractive to much of the world. And that's the thing. As you share this message, 
Christianity, what it tells you, that first glance, you are just as wicked as the wretches you look down upon. You are awful. You are terrible. That's the first thing it says. When you go to try and it says we're talking about evangelism, and that aim to persuade, and you're talking to someone and say, hey, basically you suck. I mean, is that going to win a lot of folks to Christianity upon first glance? You tell someone you're terrible, you're awful, you need this. Sometimes there may be a slap in the face followed. There may be other obscenities, words that come your way. And that's why at first, Christianity is not that attractive. Because we live in a world that tries to prove we're good people, we're loving, even better than certain types of people. The gospel lays us flat on our backs and says, no, you're not. There's one fan base that annoys me more than any other. I guess I said, I grew up in Texas, Texas A&M, the fans, the cult-like fans, they annoy me more than any other, so I love the fact that in the SEC they got beat like a drum in the Big 12, they're getting beat like a drum in the SEC, which is wonderful. But the truth is, even on my best days, I'm worse than these fans that I look down upon. That's my heart apart from Christ. Or we start thinking about, well, wait, wait, I'm not the man who's beating his wife. Or I'm not the woman who left her kids in an affair. Or I'm not the college student who's getting drunk every weekend. I mean, come on, I'm not as bad as those guys or girls. And the truth is, yes, we are. All of us are that bad. We can never excuse the sinful behavior of others. But the light must shine even brighter in our own lives so that we see our own condition. And when other people see that we've owned, we are sinful, we are wretched, we are fallen, it compels us to love others because of how incredible it is that God has loved us. And it is by loving others that the curse is reversed. Because as we genuinely love others, it's impossible for sin to be hardening us. The security of the gospel allows us to love others because our meaning, our satisfaction, and our purpose is no longer derived from the physical world around us. Talk is cheap. Truly loving one another is costly. Uh, one of the things that social media has allowed is allowed folks to become a whole lot more bold than they really are. Folks will say things on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, Vine, Snapchat that they would never say face-to-face to somebody else. And we will make those claims, but we can never back those up. And if we think like someone in here may say, hey, you know what, I have more musical talents than Taylor Swift or the Avid Brothers. Come on, I can do that. Well, then can you back it up? Or we may come here and say, hey, I can throw a tighter spiral than Aaron Rodgers. I'll be greater than him. Back it up. You can say that all the day long. You look at my skinny frame right here. I can say, hey, I'm going to be the greatest offensive lineman that's ever lived. Can I say that? All day long. Can I prove it? No. And the thing is, we can talk a big game about loving others. Because the love of God is woven into us, we can love others well. So it's not just talking about it. It's truly loving one another so that we can see change happen. And the love of the Father reminds us of this truth, that the Father's love was personally costly. He turned his back, as we were talking about earlier with propitiation, turned his back on his son to appease his own wrath. That is the definition of painful and costly. And it is going to be, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the coming days, but just a brief glimpse. Sometimes it is very painful, very painful to love those around us. And sometimes it is very costly. But again, that goes back to the heartbeat of evangelism. Loving one another as He has loved us. It is doing what no one else will do. And sometimes what no one is doing, sometimes it can actually even be a little easier. Sometimes it can be as simple as, hey, I'm not going to badmouth a coworker. I'm not going to badmouth a fellow classmate. I'm not going to badmouth a coach. Maybe even praising them instead. Maybe you thought about that. Think about all the times in the hallways, all the times in the locker rooms, on the field, wherever you may be, how quickly gossip happens. And again, talking about tearing others down. And if all of a sudden we just kind of said, hey, you know what? I really like Coach so-and-so. That was good. Or hey, I really like this individual. All of a sudden that conversation turns. And Lord God, hopefully someone asks a question why that conversation turns. Sometimes you can even be sending an encouraging note, an encouraging text. I mean, it is funny... I'm a 34-year-old guy, and I've got an executive minister who's in his 60s. He'll send me a text. He gets up crazy early, like 3.34 in the morning. So when I wake up, there's this text praying for you. 
You know, how can I pray for you? That still gets me. I, that encouragement. Are we looking to encourage those around us? Or maybe it's not something as simple as in your neighborhood. You notice, hey, you've got a neighbor. Their yard's getting a little tall. Knock on their door. Hey, can I mow your yard too? And some man, why are you doing this? Hey, I just want to love you well. Uh, those are things that can be a little bit easier. Sometimes it can be a little bit more costly. Um, it's serving those in need. It may be someone you know who's sick. And it's sitting with them at the hospital. Or it may be visiting that nursing home and you get to know some of those around there and engaging in conversation. It may be praying and crying with a friend who just broke up with a boyfriend or girlfriend. Those are great gospel opportunities right there. And or it may be you've got a friend whose parents just told them they're getting a divorce. And it's sitting with that friend, caring with that friend. It's not easy. It may not be the fun thing but it is what God can use. And then sometimes there's even the more painful, close relationships. Sometimes it may be in confrontation. Sometimes our best friend since childhood has made decisions that is making their life more and more difficult, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, and you do that intervention. Or maybe the individual, like we talked about, who has made your life difficult, maybe physically beats you up, spread words about you, and it's loving them and caring for them. Maybe even sending them an encouraging text. Maybe asking them, hey, how can I pray for you? Or it may be the individual who appears to have it all. Um, and that's we're going to watch a video tomorrow that kind of hits on this. But one of the things that social media also allows us to do is it makes our lives look like they're better than they really are. We post only typically only the really good pictures. When we're on vacation, we post a picture you know, when we're with on that date or whoever asked us to the dance. And someone's life may look like it's going really good. But the thing is, deep down, it's not. And those that are popular, those that seem to have success, can we love them? Because sometimes those are the people that are the toughest to love. Because they're like, we think they have everything. But as we'll see in that video, video tomorrow, that's not the case. So, what these difficult people need more than anything else is they need Jesus. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, He will enable us to love those even that we want to naturally hate. And the thing is, they may never change. They may never change. And there was one, (laughs) when we were running across country track, there were a few of us that would get together and pray three times a week as a team. It was just three of us to begin with. And there was one girl on the team, I mean, she was the meanest girl I'd ever been around. I mean, just cutthroat, rude just everyone avoided her. And I can remember, we started praying for her. And a year and a half later, God changed her heart. God saved her. And that's the thing to me, I'm like, God, I say, surely, you're not saving her. That's not going to happen. That heart is way too hard. But God didn't work on that heart. But some of the other hearts, the guys and girls that were real easy to get along with, as far as, as, far as I know, those hearts never changed. So the thing is, we trust in the Holy Spirit. And as we trust in the Holy Spirit, Lord, help me to love others so that you can do a change. And so, that leads to the third thing. Overwhelmed by a relentless God leads to us loving others. And this leads to a changed community. Just imagine that for a moment. What a unique community that would be where individuals were truly loving one another. Where they thought, I want what's best for you before I want what's best for me. Because typically the moment we get out of bed... I want what's best for me. Don't get in my way. And if you get in my way, it's going to be pain. So it's retraining. Think about that community as more and more people think, I want others to get good before me. It would be a place that we would long for. A place where loving others was not based upon how we were feeling that day. Hey, I'm having a bad day. Just not going to love. No. Even when we feel like we're having a bad day, we're going to love others. It's a place that's not based upon what others have done to us. It's not based upon where someone goes to school, what someone looks like, or what benefits we might get for doing nice things. But it was a love that went beyond the eyes. Because there are a lot of people who my eyes tell me, they tell me not to love. Meaning that there are a lot of reasons, as we said before, a lot of reasons. My eyes are saying, don't love them. But the gospel is saying, love them. So instead of people walking into a room and sizing each other up and saying, and we know, we know we do. We step in a room and you're like, I'm better than him. Oop, not as good as him. I'm better than her. Oop, not as good as her. Instead of going into a room like that, we're saying, we walk into this room, 
does he know Jesus? Does she know Jesus? Well, God, how can you use me? How can you display your love through me in this situation where you have placed me? That would be a community where people give of their time and resources because they want others to be overwhelmed by the relentless God who loved them first. We have been overcome by the relentless God, and I hope you have, because that is what makes sharing the gospel such a joy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you Lord, that you did not leave us on an island. We thank you that we get to do this as a body of believers because, Lord, there are many days, Lord, that I don't feel like loving others. I don't feel like sharing your name. But, Lord God, I pray that we would encourage one another to boldly declare your name to the many places that you have taken us. And, Lord God, that your love would be woven into us, Lord, that that heartbeat of evangelism will continue to be because if we are not, Lord, if your love's not woven into us, then, Lord, we are not able to love others well. Lord God, do a great work among us. Give us energy, Lord, for the rest of this day that we would delight in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Y'all enjoy the first...